Uh, welcome to the seventh CRC Roundtable, a monthly virtual seminar series. Uh, our intention is to host targeted, inclusive, and informed conversations matching scientific advances and management needs. These webinars are designed for contribution, not consumption. So each seminar invites a diverse range of researchers, managers, and other professionals to have conversations around critical topics in order to build connectivity between all of us and increase our collective competency for decision making. As a reflection of that intent, the panelists have been given about 25 to 30 minutes total to make some introductory remarks, allowing a full 30 minutes for discussion. This is all about you and us, uh, giving a place to ask the clumsy questions and, and to practice the bravery and humility necessary for building the future we want. Um, this roundtable follows the last webinar on local action for resilience in the face of sea level rise, which dealt with one type of boundary, one between water and all of the infrastructure associated with human society. At each of these webinars, we've begun by answering the question of why this topic at this time by these speakers. Um, and so this one, we're continuing with our discussion of boundaries, but this time with that complicated zone of the land water interface. Our understanding of each side of that boundary has increased significantly over the history of the Bay Program. And we now stand on either side of it facing each other as scientists and practitioners and, and wondering what happens in that space. As it turns out, a lot happens in that space, and it is of great import to many of the ecosystem services that we value. Um, why this time? It's especially appropriate to be looking at, at um, shallow waters at this point in the spring season where uh, many of the conditions for bay health are being set up. Um, it's also a place where, uh, since the monitoring began in 1985, we're beginning to really see the impacts of our restoration efforts. In addition, we've been doing a lot since the 2014 watershed agreement. And it's interesting to note that um, over half of those recommendations really relate to um, shallow waters. So it's, it's an important topic, it's a timely topic, and the people that we have speaking to it are wonderful. Both of them are seasoned travelers to that boundary space. Um, Marjorie Friedrichs, whose research focuses on quantifying the historical and future impacts of climate and land use changes, on um, hypoxia, acidification, and biogeochemistry in coastal and estuarine systems, and Raleigh Hood, whose research is focused primarily on using models to simulate and predict biogeochemical and ecological variability in marine environments. Each of our panelists has extensive experience, and I'm sure each of them could fill an hour by themselves. But we've asked them to limit their remarks to a very short time period, and, and that is a challenge. And so panelists, I will try to gracefully let you know when you are at the 12 to 15 minute mark. Um, if you have material that you are unable to share because of that time limit, we will find a way to make your slides or additional remarks available to all attendees. The most important part of this hour is the opportunity for attendees to be able to ask the brave and clumsy questions. And so um, please help me do that. And with no further words, um, let me ask Marjorie Friedrichs to start the webinar. All right. Set up here. Okay, so you should be able to see that. So thank you, Denise, for those introductions and for the uh, invitation to come participate in today's roundtable. Um, today, Raleigh and I want to talk to you all a little bit about the shallow waters of the bay. Um, before we get started, though, I just want to begin by noting a caveat that although we both have a long history of using shallow water monitoring data, our, our presentation today is really going to be um, presented from kind of the perspective of our background in estuarine modeling. Um, and it's the relevance of modeling uh, the shallows for the managing the bay watershed. So first off, what do we mean by shallow waters? Um, I, I started my career actually working in the open ocean. So back then the continental shelf was, was shallow to me. Other folks may think, you know, shallow waters mean you can walk into the water and not get my shorts wet. Here, so everyone has their own definition here. We're using um, 
basically less than three meters. So that's what on the right panel here, you can see the red, in, I'm shaded, have shaded in all the areas less than three meters. So you can see that's a really large fraction of the bay. So the shallow waters are, are, are make up a, a large percentage of the bay. Um, but they're also important for a number of other reasons. And for instance, these are really the waters that most of us see on a daily basis. These are the waters we see where we work and where we live. Um, you know, all of us may go, okay, or some of us may occasionally go out into the main stem bay for some recreational activities, but it's really the, the shallows where we, where we see the bay. Um, and this is also, unfortunately, historically been um, where we've noticed significant degradation of bay water quality. So for instance, this is where we see the harmful algal blooms often. This is where we see the, the, the poor water clarity, the murky waters. Um, so this is this this is a, a, a problematic part of the bay that that we're we're really seeing, and this is also um, where we're likely to see early responses to management actions on the on the bright side. So this, although I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how the nutrient reductions in the bay have really been geared to improving oxygen concentrations at the bottom of the the main stem bay. What we're real, how we're really judging the the success of these actions is actually in these in these shallow waters. Um, and this is where we're actually going to likely see the first responses to these management actions. Um, so why do we need improved models of the shallow waters? We do have a lot of monitoring data now in the shallow water. Um, so why do we need models? Um, and, and for two reasons. First of all, we really depend on models to, um, to basically assess the impacts of various nutrient reduction strategies. So we do numerical, we being the Bay Program, folks, other folks, uh, you know, in order to assess how much uh, reductions we need in nutrient runoff, we run numerical modeling experiments to see, do we need to reduce and to find out where, where is it most impactful to reduce um, nutrient inputs to the bay. And the other way we use models often is, is to look at the impacts of climate change. And that's not something we're gonna talk about too much today, but in order to look at what the bay conditions are like, going to be like in the future in 2025 or 2050, we really need to use numerical models that, that incorporate our knowledge of, of what's going to be happening to the atmosphere, condi atmospheric conditions and other conditions, sea level rise um, in the future. So those are, those are reasons why we really um, need improved, uh, need shallow water models. Unfortunately, modeling shallow waters is really challenging. And that's kind of why we have, a, we have a great watershed model. We've got an estuarine model. And now we're really looking at that, at that region in between, just like Denise was saying, that land ocean or land water, water interface. Um, so why is it so challenging? Well, I think looking at this photograph of the Chester River really kind of gives you the feeling why this would be challenging to, to model, math, model mathematically. Um, the coastline here is changing, you know, on very small uh, spatial scales. The time scales uh, relevant here are, are very short as well. On the other hand, we need to resolve the, the, the longer space and time scales we need in the, in the outer region here. You can begin to see the open water of the bay. We need models that can, can uh, act, can, can model both on the, the very small time scales and in very local uh, regions here, but also can resolve the, the, the bay as well and the interaction at the, at the river mouth where the tributary enters the main bay. So we really need models um, that can act on all these um, different scales. And in fact, such state-of-the-art models really have been developed and there's been a lot of development over the past decade um, and are now really routinely used in the academic and research communities in the, in the bay, as well as globally in estuaries across the world. However, here in the bay, these such state-of-the-art models are really not yet used for management decisions, but hopefully that day will, will be approaching soon. So what do we use? Well, this is, a lot of you may be familiar with the, the Chesapeake Bay uh, modeling system, but this is just a, a general schematic. So we the main crux of it is a watershed model, which we colloquially call phase six, because there's been lots of phases earlier. And then we have an estuary model, which we have to give the catchy name to of the WQSTM, the Water Quality Sediment Transport Model. Um, and so these are the two main components, but there's also a number of other components that go into this. For instance, we have a land use change model and there's an airshed model um, and a lot of model and, and data inputs are fed right into the phase six model. 
that model's run, and then those outputs are fed into the water quality sediment transport model, the estuarine model. And then we use those modeling results to really set the, the TMDL targets, the, the nutrient reductions. Um, so we, we, and it's interestingly, um, in order to determine how much nutrients and sediment need to be reduced, we, we base this on primarily bottom oxygen concentrations in the deep main stem bay. So there's water quality standards, you know, that by water quality standards, I mean how, um, how we want the bay to look in its purely restored form. What, is our, what are our goals in the future for the bay? Um, and there are a number based on chlorophyll, um, water clarity, and oxygen, but the oxygen is the most stringent. So we end up setting the TMDLs largely to uh, improve bottom oxygen concentrations in the main stem bay, which is uh, where they are the lowest. Um, interestingly, however, the assessment of, of restoration success largely focuses on the shallows. So it's kind of a, a contradiction there. Um, and, and what I mean by that is if we look at the Chesapeake Bay uh, 2014 watershed agreement it has 10 goals and 31 outcomes for restoring the bay. And it turns out that 16, if you count them as Raleigh has, 16 of these 31 outcomes actually involve the shallow water tributaries. And then if you go further, 12 of these 16 actually involve higher trophic level species and, and living resources. So that's something we wanna talk about uh, today too. So just a brief outline here. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how well we've been modeling the shallows um, in, in the past. Uh, and then Raleigh's gonna take a more forward looking uh, approach here. He's gonna talk about how, how we've been modeling the higher trophic levels and how we're, we're gonna do that in the future. And, and, and also where we generally go from here in terms of modeling these shallow waters. So this is a, something that, that Raleigh and I and others have been thinking about for a very long time. And actually I was um, amazed to see that, that it was back actually in January, 2012, where STAC, the, the Science and Technical Advisory Committee for the, for the Chesapeake Bay actually recommended the implementation of a multiple modeling effort for identifying models uh, that best match the data we have in the shallow waters of the tidal uh, Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. So, Hard to believe that was almost a decade ago, but after several years, we, we uh, a research project was spun up and funded by the EPA, which which involved a lot of investigators from a, from a lot of different institutions, um, and ultimately the the main overarching research questions that that uh, drove this this effort was one is is the existing estuarine model used for management decisions, the uh, water quality sediment transport model, adequate for the shallows? And how much better are higher resolution models that, that use these new modeling methodologies? So we decided to implement this um, study in the Chester River. So this is a, a tributary, a small tributary up here in the, in the northeastern uh, Chesapeake Bay. It's got a, a channel here. It's got a history of some, some hypoxic conditions uh, and, and a lot of uh, pollution and nutrient runoff. So it was of interest in that regard, 65 kilo kilometers long. Um, and another reason why we selected this is at that time, it was, it was one of the regions that had a, a, a large amount of data available in, in, this, um, in the shallow water. So we've got the, the red stars here denote the two water quality monitoring stations. The uh, orange pluses um, show the continuous monitoring stations that are, are um, uh, located in the shoals of the uh, Chester River. And then we've got the data flow, all these red dots as the uh, cruise goes up and stops at each of these stations bi-weekly. So the data we were using uh, came from 2003 to 2006 from these stations and included the, the typical salinity, temperature, oxygen, chlorophyll, and, and TSS. So the four model, the four primary models that, that participated in this uh, comparison effort were, were, are shown here, their grids are shown here. In the upper left, we've got the, the management model. And so these, these, these panels here are, are give you an idea for the relative resolution of the models. So the resolution is very low of the existing management model. So here, each red dot represents a, a model grid cell. So essentially in this area inset here, because there's only one red dot, one grid cell here, this model is assuming that there's no change throughout this region at all. All of those have the same salinity, temperature, uh, water, uh, uh, oxygen um, throughout that area. So in comparison, FVCOM is a much higher resolution. So here you can see how much it resolves. Um, this is a sch the schism model down here, which has high resolution and kind of in the channel. 
Uh, and down here is, is a ROMS implementation um, that, was, that was participating in this comparison as well. So we used all these four models, ran them through very similar experiments, forced them in the same way with the same uh, watershed input uh, results, uh, model results, um, and in order to compare them to the data to see how they, they uh, performed. So I'm just gonna show you two very uh, quick results here of, the, of this study. Um, here we have mean annual bottom salinity on the y-axis, and then the x-axis represents um, distance along the Chester River. So this is the open bay on the left going upstream on the right. And the black symbols and line show the data. The blue shows the management model for the Bay program. And then these three represent the higher resolution models. So what you can Im immediately see is that the, the management model, WQSTM, really is completely missing the change in salinity as you go upstream in the Chester. After you get past about this point, there's really very little in, uh, decrease in salinity in that model as compared to the higher resolution models, which much more closely uh, reproduce the, the observations, the black dots here. So the high resolution models um, do much better and they, they also do similarly well, we found. So we also did this uh, for a number of other variables and here I just am showing oxygen. Um, when here the results are similar, um, we see that the high resolution models uh, follow the data quite well um, and uh, show, in fact, potentially a little increase in, in oxygen as compared to the, the management model here in blue, which actually shows hypoxia and anoxia in the upper, river, upper portion of the, the, the Chester River, which is not um, apparent from the observations at all. So as a result of this study, um, we came up with a number of recommendations for, for Bay Program Modeling. Again, this, this is now um, five years ago or so, but these were our recommendations at that point. And we, we really pointed out that we really need a um, high, re high resolution model that can, that can resolve the bathymetry, the complex bathymetry and coastline of these shallow waters, and also has enough vertical resolution to resolve that estuarine circulation and, and get the, the fresh water out and the, the salty water in to the uh, tributary. Um, we also emphasize the, the importance of using multiple research models. Um, we found a lot of, uh, we found various um, advantages and, and disadvantages of various different formulations as part of this project and inconsistencies. And overall, it, it really increase, can increase the confidence in, in any one model um, when, when using multiple uh, different research models. Uh, and finally, another point which I didn't emphasize too much today uh, is the need to carefully cons consider the connection between the shallow waters and the open bay. That open bay boundary really Im impacts greatly what's going on in the tributary. Um, so one thing we did not recommend was separate models for the shallows and a separate model for the main stem. And instead, what we really uh, was clear from this project that we really needed was really a seamless transition uh, between the two. Um, using either some uh, form of nesting or some hybrid grid that can really resolve both the, the, the larger scales in the open bay and the smaller scales in the shallows and in the tributaries. So with that, I'm going to now turn this over to Raleigh for the second half of the presentation. Okay. Let's get the screen sharing here. Okay. Can everybody see this okay? Shake your head, yes. Yes, Raleigh. I will take that as a yes. Okay. Um, so uh, looking forward, what I'm going to be focusing on in, in the second half of the talk is what does the Bay Program estuarine model, which we're referring to as WQSTM, what does it do well and, and why is it inadequate for the shallows? Uh, and I want to talk about reiterate that many of the restoration goals and outcomes are not only geared to the shallows, but also to higher trophic levels in those shallow waters. So what I'm gonna talk about what higher trophic models we have and are they adequate to the task? And then I'll wrap it up by uh, summarizing some of the recommendations from a visioning workshop that we, that we convened back in 2018, which we're actually working on a manuscript right now uh, for publication in e ecological modeling. Um, but I want to, just for clarity, I want to define here that uh, Mar Margie introduced this concept, the, the water quality and sediment transport model of the Chesapeake Bay. That's the Bay program model that's used, used for setting 
total maximum daily loads, okay? And as, as I go through, it, that model is con composed of two major components. CH3D, that's, that's curvilinear hydrodynamics in three dimensions, that's the hydrodynamic model. And ICM, the integrated uh, compartment water quality model. And that's, that's the biogeochemical component of WQSTM. Okay, oops. Okay, so as Margie mentioned, 16 of the 31 outcomes of the 2014 Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement involve shallow water tributaries of the Chesapeake Bay, and 12 of these 16 outcomes involve higher trophic level species and or living resources like SAV, okay? Yet, the Chesapeake Bay Program modeling system is designed to set total maximum daily loads where these TMDLs are based on oxygen concentrations in the main stem of the bay, not in the shallow waters. Uh, and, and, and because of this, the Chesapeake Bay Program modeling system is specifically designed and tuned to simulate oxygen concentrations in the main stem bay, not in the shallow tributaries. Uh, in addition, and I'll talk about these models, we have only a handful of models for simulating higher trophic level species uh, and or living resources in these shallow waters. Okay, so the, the, the WSTM uh, is composed, as I said, of two components, CH3D, the hydrodynamic model, and ICM, the water quality model. Uh, CH3D it stands for curvilinear hydrodynamics in three dimensions. The model, this is the, a, a picture of the full Chesapeake Bay grid of the model. It's very impressive. <clears throat> it has 56,920 uh, total cells with an average grid cell dimension of about 1,000 by 1,000 meters. And it provides the, hy the hydrodynamic output to drive ICM, the water quality model. Okay, and this model does a very good job of, of doing what it was designed to do, and that's simulating the hydrodynamics in the main stem bay. Okay, and it, it's an amazing grid. It's very computationally intensive. It requires supercomputers to run it. Yet, as you, as you saw from Margie's slides, as you get up into, say, the upper reaches of tributaries like the Chester River, the resolution just isn't good enough. Okay, and in fact, it, it collapses often in the upper reaches of these tributaries to one vertical le level and one horizontal cell. Okay, so, uh, so it has poor vertical resolution in shallow waters, and it's a Z-grid formulation. What that means is that, is that, is that the structure of, of the vertical is in level, level planes, okay? And so as you go into the shallow waters, those level planes drop away and it, and it shallows in a stair-step like manner, okay? It also has poor horizontal resolution in the shallow water tributaries because it has, it has a, what's called a non-orthogonal curv curvilinear coordinates. And to make a long story short, it's just, it's just a, a coordinate system that just isn't very good at fitting into all the little nooks and crannies in the shallow water tributaries. And another deficiency in the model, which is common in, in newer research models, is CH3D doesn't have wetting and drying. And what it, that means is it, is it can't go dry when the tide goes out. You can't, it can't create tide flats and that creates some issues. So that's the hydrodynamic model CH3D. ICM, which uses, as I said, the output from the hydrodynamic model, um, along with nutrient sediment uh, loads prescribed by the Bay Program's watershed model, um, it, it's used to force the bio, biogeochemical model ICM. Um, ICM also does a good job of simulating what it was designed to simulate, that's oxygen concentrations in the main stem bay. And just to, just to give you a couple de details about, about ICM, it carries carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and oxygen. It has 24 state variables. It has three algal groups, and it also has a, a benthic diagenesis sub, submodel as well as a se sediment transport submodel. And I've just got a couple of schematics here to give you some idea of, of how the compartments are structured. This is the N cycle uh, 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 in ICM, um, and this is the oxygen cycle in ICM, okay? Um, but it has, in part because it, it runs on the exact same grid as, as CH3D, it has some of the same issues. Um, but first of all, 
Similarly, it's not designed or tuned to simulate oxygen concentrations in shallow water. It's designed to simulate them in the deep main stem bay to, to determine TMDLs. As with the hydrodynamic grid, it's the same grid. It has poor resolution in shallow water. Um, another issue with, with ICM is it has one-way coupling to the hydrodynamic model. What that means is, is that the hydrodynamic model is run all by itself. The output from the hydrodynamic model is then used offline to force ICM, the biogeochemical model, but the ICM does not feed back in any way to the physics, okay? And that's, that's a problem. Um, and uh, also there's currently no link to higher trophic levels. Uh, no, I'm sorry, there's no zooplankton uh, link to higher trophic levels in the ICM model. The, mo the model only co carries phytoplankton and it has a mortality term, but it does not carry uh, uh, explicit zooplankton. And that creates a problem with linking to higher trophic levels because if you don't have zoo, you need zooplankton to feed to the fish, to the little fish, to feed to the bigger fish, et cetera, okay? So that's, that's uh, ICM. Uh, the BAE program, uh, ICM also has two living resource models that are dynamically coupled to it. There is an, S, uh, an SAV model, uh, which is incorporated into ICM to calculate water clarity and the SA, SAV standard. Uh, and, and the positive thing about this is that the SAV model is dynamically coupled and feeds back and forth to the ICM model. But it has a, it has the same issues that ICM does in terms of poor uh, model resolution in shallow water. As you can see, this is a diagram of SCV distributions in the Chesapeake Bay in 2003, and you can see that modeling SCV is fundamentally a shallow water modeling problem. And some other issues with the SAV model is it does not produce particularly realistic SAV distribution, distributions and growth response, and this is in part due to the fact that that the SAV in this model doesn't respond to variable substrates. There are no variable substrates in, in, in the ICM model. So the SAV can grow anywhere where there's enough light. And of course, that's, uh, that's not always the case. Um, the ICM also includes a, uh, a, a benthic filter feeder model. It's a, it has three filter feeder groups. And this benthic, benthic filter feeder model is also dynamic, dynamically coupled to ICM. This is a simple diagram of that model with the filter feeders at the water column sediment in interface, which are filter particulate matter out of the water column. And they, and they move that via bio deposits into the sediment. So this, this benthic uh, filter feeder model is fully dynamically coupled to, to, the IC, to the ICM model. But again, uh, modeling filter feeders for the most part, especially with oysters, is fundamentally a shallow water modeling problem. And we have the same problems, poor model, resolution in the shallow waters, as well as issues with parameterization and val validation. Uh, 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 things like knowing where the oyster, oyster bed locations are and, and what the densities of the oysters are. Moving on now, there's a couple of other uh, 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 higher trophic level models that, that have been developed for uh, Chesapeake, Bay Pro Chesapeake Bay management, although not actually applied. and, and these have been developed by the NOAA Chesapeake Bay office, um, and they include uh, what's called the Chesapeake Bay Fisheries Ecosystem Management Model, or CBFEM. And this is the model that's built on a very widely used modeling package called Ecopath with Ecosystem Sim. And, and it allows us to simulate 45 trophic groups uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, this is just a list of those groups. You can see it's a huge range of organisms that can be simula simulated, like striped bass and Atlantic croaker and, and American eel, okay? Um, and it also, this model, this model, what it does is it gives a, a snapshot uh, uh, interactions of all these organisms in the, in the Chesapeake Bay, but it's averaged over the whole Chesapeake Bay. Okay, so there is no spatial resolution at all. It's one giant model of the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem. And, but it does have the capability through this, through this component of Ecopath called Ecosim, which allows us to move that model forward in time. And in fact, it's been forced with output from ICM, chlorophyll A output, output from ICM, uh, to look at how things like management actions might affect higher trophic level uh, responses, okay, which potentially allows uh, ecosystem-based management. 
Um, but as I said, there's big drawbacks with this model. It's not spatially explicit. It's an average of the entire chess peak. Uh, there are large parameter and output uncertainties because there's a huge number of parameters, obviously, in a model like this. There's only one-way coupling. ICM forces this model, but this model does not feed back to the ICM water quality model. And it's currently not being used by the Bay Program as a management tool. Another tool that's been developed by uh, the NOAA Chesapeake Bay office is called the Chesapeake Bay Atlantis model, or CAM. It's also based on a widely used uh, uh, multi-trophic level model, ecosystem model that was developed down uh, at CSIRO by Beth Fulton and her colleagues. And it has a domain that's composed of 97 irregular poly poly grant, polygons. This is a, a picture of the dom domain. It includes 26 in in invertebrate functional groups, including primary produ producers and bacterial groups, and 29 ver uh, verte vertebrate groups. And so this model also potentially allows us to do ecosystem-based management. We can look at how a, a change in, say, the nutrient forcing to the bay might propagate up through higher trophic levels. But obviously it has very coarse uh, resolution, 97 cells over the whole, whole bay. There's no linkages or feedbacks to ICM or CH3D. Um, again, similarly with, with, uh, with the Ecopath Ecosim model, there are large parameter and output uncertainties. Uh, and, and this model is also not currently in, employed by the Bay Programs and Management Tool. So, so those are the tools that we have. So um, in summary, uh, a, a, a lot of what we need to do in terms of, of modeling and, and understanding uh, management uh, actions have to do with shallow waters and high, higher trophic levels. CH3 does not adequately re resolve the shallow tributaries of Chesapeake Bay. ICM is not designed or tuned to simulate shallow water oxygen concentrations. ICM includes only two higher trophic level models, that's the SAV and benthic filter feeders. And although we have some models uh, developed by NCPO uh, that for ecosystem and living resources, they are not currently be being used for management. So that's kind of where we are. I'll just wrap up here with, with some recommend, quick recommendations that came out of this visioning workshop that we did that was funded by Stack back in 2018. Uh, that we're currently revising a manuscript for publication in ecological models, uh, ecological modeling. Um, there were 17, 70 sa scientists and managers uh, participated in this workshop, and it was designed to identify needed modifications and advancements to this CBP modeling system, specifically to address emerging management questions spurred by the 2014 Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement. And so, uh, Briefly, those recommends, recommendations include that future model development efforts should continue the present trend of resolving finer spatial scales to make estuarine models more directly applicable to assessing the performance of management actions at smaller scales relevant to local communities and stakeholders. Applications to smaller scales require that the models have sufficient resolution to resolve tributaries and relatively fast exchanges in biogeochemistry, such as dial cycling in hypoxia. And, uh, the recommendation that emerged is that from the workshop was that an unstructured hybrid grid would be a good candidate approach because it allows for the occlusion of local scale processes while maintaining efficient use of computational resources. And one of, the, one of those examples was shown uh, by, by Margie, the schism model, which has an unstructured grid. And this is a detailed schematic of, that, of the grid of that model. And you can see that it has this exquisite ability to resolve uh, the, the topography uh, uh, of, the, of the Chester River, whereas when you go up this river with, the, with, with CH3D, we're talking about single, single cells with, with one depth, okay? Um, another recommendation is that there should be an option for two-way online coupling between the hydro hydrodynamic and biogeochemical models. Uh, which would en enable investigation of, of feedbacks between, between the, the hydrodynamics hydrodynamic model and the biogeochemical model, as I said before, in the current modeling system, CH3D, CH3D output is taken as it's used to separately force 
the water quality model and the water quality model does not in any way feed back to modify the physics. And, and important examples of where this kind of feedback is needed is for example, SAV and vent venthic filter feeders impact flow, which can give rise to positive feedback effects. They can slow the sl flow, which in the case of SAV can improve the conditions for their growth. And then finally, this is my last slide. Um, uh, in terms of higher trophic levels, uh, the workshop recommendation was that multiple approaches to modeling higher trophic level species and living resources should be pursued, uh, including developing habitat suit suitability models that use the output of WQSTM. And what that means is that if, if you can define the habitat in terms of like temperature, salinity, nutrients, chlorophyll of a particular organism like striped bass, if you can define that habitat, then you can use WQSTM to predict how that habitat might change in the future and how that might impact that organism. We also recommended further develop to further develop and refine the dynamic SAV and benthic filter feeder models that are already coupled to WQSTM. Develop additional ecosystems like the NCBO models that are forced with output with, with our current uh, uh, WQSTM. And finally, further adapt and fully integrate uh, higher trophic level ecosystem models like the, the NCBO models into the water quality sediment transport model or whatever future modeling systems we decide to go with. And that's it, my last slide. Um, thank you, Raleigh and Margie, for what was certainly a whirlwind tour of the modeling environment and a number of acronyms that seem to just flow off your tongues. I don't know how you do that. So um, for those of you on the webinar, if you haven't already, if you can type in your name and affiliation, um, that's helpful, but also any questions into the chat box. And one of the features of the webinar is that um, we've been pretty successful at if all of the questions don't get answered um, today, we send them out to the panelist and we um, commit to sending out an email that's got their responses to whatever questions were not addressed um, within a week of the webinar. So um, please feel free to enter questions into the chat box and I'll moderate the discussion from there. Um, and I will kind of start off with a, um, a question that seems sort of stunning to me, which is the fact that if 16 of the 31 outcomes involve the shallows, and there is obviously a, a lot of work to be done, um, are there, well, it's, it's already in the chat box actually, is, is there any sense of what's the priority for the improvement of tools? Um, and including um, multiple models, um, investment in individual models and uh, the monitoring to support that model development. So is there a sense of, of where to go first? And I'd ask um, each of you to, to respond to that from your viewpoint. Um, I can go first maybe um, and just say, say, um, say a few things. I think we do need, um, you know, in terms, well, well, obviously, in terms of the, in terms of in the future going forward, um, shallow water monitoring data, that's, that's the crux of everything that modelers do is, is based on the shallow water modeling, monitoring data. So that's just incredibly important. We've done a pretty good job, but we need to keep that up. If anything, in the future, I think going forward, we need long time series. We've done the, for the continuous monitoring in the shallows, we often uh, have a, uh, one area studied well for three years, then we moved to another area for three years and another area for three years. In my ideal world, we would have a couple stations where we've got long 20 year time series of, of this. Um, so setting up a few individual stations where we can get long term data would be would be fabulous. I think in so that's kind of my my uh, comment on the, the monitoring in terms of the modeling. Um, I, I think we've we've put out a lot of and Raleigh put forward a, a number of different recommendations going forward. I think one of the things um, I'll just highlight is the, 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 cup, the obviously we need higher resolution to get into the shallows. Um, that's, that's absolutely clear. I think one of the things that, that 
um, came out a little bit in what Raleigh said and not less in what I said, it was that one of the, but that also came out of the shallow water multiple modeling uh, project was the importance of, of fully coupling the, the physics and the water quality. So uh, just as, as Raleigh was just saying, the, the not only does the physics drive changes in water quality, but water quality changes in, in water quality and um, the, the living resources can change the, the physics. And so that, that coupling needs to be there in, in terms of the modeling. Um, and then finally, the, the um, higher, you know, we, we think of uh, higher trophic levels in the, from, the, from the water quality side as being zooplankton, right? And so that, that zooplankton link is really missing. We don't, the, the current version of the, the Bay Program, the management model does not have zooplankton in it. And the reason is, is that there's just not enough uh, data inf information about to constrain that part of the model. But so that's an area that, that needs more study um, for sure. So I'll just maybe highlight those. Um, couple things, but I'm sure you've got lots else to say, Raleigh. Actually, you said exactly what I would have said. And the only, <laughs> thing I would, the only thing I would add to that is that we're really behind the curve in terms of higher trophic level and living resource modeling. Um, it, that, that, that whole effort has been sort of left behind with, because of our, our, our focus on modeling the main stem bay and oxygen concentrations and water quality in the main stem bay. Um, and in fact, one of the recommendations that, is, that has come out of, of that workshop is that we really need to, we don't even have committees in place like we do for everything else in the Bay Program. We have, we have committees for, for, for the model development um, and for BMPs and all sorts of things that are in place to move, to progress these, these, our understanding, but we don't have that in place for higher trophic level and re living resource modeling. And, and a specific recommendation that came out of that workshop was that we need to put the committees in place like we have for, these, for the other aspects of what we do with models to, to push those uh, modeling efforts forward. Hmm. Oh, thank you. Um, let me, we have a lot of questions. So first one is, is pretty specific. Maybe we can get to that uh, pretty quickly. Uh, Patrick Neal wrote, for the model comparison in the Chester River, how were the biogeochemical dynamics modeled? Was ICM used for everything? No, good question. Um, it, it was not. So we had a few, we had a both, um, we had ICM and also RCA. And so two different um, water quality um, models. So, so, you know, we weren't able to just isolate um, one component. A number of things were were, were changing at once, but um, there were there were multiple um, different um, models used. But really, the 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 biggest driver of the differences between the performance of the models really seemed to be whether the resolution, both the horizontal and the vertical resolution of the models, rather than the particular water quality uh, model that was used. Um, and, and Margie, just as a, a little bit of a reminder for people that um, don't live in this world all the time, do you want to just briefly comment on the value of a multiple model approach? Sure, sure. Um, and this is, this is something that Stack has, the, has recommended for a long time. Um, ultimately, you know, we, we need one management model. So decisions have to really be made on, on one model potentially, but there's, there is a huge benefit to having a lot of research models behind the scene and providing inputs. You know, if, if you have uh, four different, you know, right now we probably have, I don't know, eight or 10 different models of the Chesapeake Bay running in research mode. Um, and one person finds one, one great result. Oh my gosh, this, this, this process is incredibly important. Then everyone else kind of adds it in and, and sees if it's important in the other models. And, and then eventually when there's a consensus, it hopefully gets moved up to the, the management model and, and, and put in there. And it really, um, you know, one person could say, well, this is important, but then sometimes the other modelers say, well, maybe it's not, maybe that's just for your, you know, it's, it, so it's a really check and checks and balances. Um, and it really, when all the models provide the same result that, um, you know, one, one of, uh, for instance, how, how something will react to climate change, when they all show the same thing, there's just, that just really increases confidence in, in that result. So I think it's a, it's a really important uh, aspect going forward, even though it potentially uh, can be seen as muddying the waters a little bit. Um, it, what it's really doing is increasing confidence in, in the results. Nice expression, muddying the water. <laughs> Um, the, the next question is, um, Raleigh, maybe I'll throw this to you and or Margie. Uh, Larry Sanford's 
uh, point is that in many truly shallow water environments, wave forcing is the dominant physical influence on benthic and shoreline inputs. How can this be better incorporated? Uh, it will definitely can be better incorporated. The, uh, the Bay Program modeling system currently has, a, as, as Larry knows, it has a wave parameterization uh, for, for inducing sediment resuspension and, and shoreline erosion. Um, it incorporates fetch. Um, in, uh, in fact, Larry could probably talk to, to that more specifically than I can. But, but these, these newer models, it's very common for, the, for these newer research models to carry explicit submodels, submodels sub that explicitly model waves and, and their interaction uh, how they and how they modify the hydrodynamics. So, in so you know, in terms of the capabilities that we currently have in the research uh, realm, uh, are vastly superior to what to what we currently do with with the uh, with the Bay Program model. Uh, we have a lot of questions about monitoring, um, and I'll try to combine one from Kathy Boomer and one from uh, Norm O'Foran. So. It, um, Kathy asked, how does your experience with these shallow water model applications influence your ideas about where we need to augment the existing monitoring network? And, and Norm also said, sounds like the existing monitoring and available data needs to be augmented. Um, if so, are there plans or efforts underway? So the question really is, um, what in your experience would lead you to sort of prioritize about where to augment the existing monitoring network? And along with that, are there any plans or efforts underway to do that? Um, I would, I'll, I'll, yeah, so there's a lot, a lot to get into there. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab first. Um, yes, I would, I would certainly agree. We can always have more data and more data is always gonna be useful. And, and as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, more data, what I really want is long time. I want, I want data back to 1985, <laughs> what a long time series, um, you know, but obviously we can't get historical, more historical data, um, but a, a, a long time series is, is really, you know, in this time of global change, there's nothing that is, is more useful in, in, in my view. Um, there is the issue that our current models are not at all representing the data that we have, you know, so, it, it, you know, just a, uh, you know, if we get, get, you know, that's, so it's a really, you know, in some sense, that's what we really needed to do is to get the, the models uh, able to reproduce the data we have. Um, that's gonna exacerbate the situation with more data, but it's not that we don't need more, more data, of course. As to where to put them, put more data, um, it is, you know, we, we, we have, uh, you know, I, I guess ideally we've got a lot of data that, um, is available, yeah, you know, it's, it, to me, it's, I, I would, we have all these data for three years in the continuous monitoring in different regions. And I would love to have one, so just stay in one place so we could really monitor change over, over a long time period. Uh, maybe, maybe you can comment on, on the where question, Riley, I don't know. Well, I don't know about the where, but, but I feel like from our experience, I think data management is also a little bit of an issue because, because we have the Bay Program data that goes way back. It's very, it's, it's, Pretty well organized, uh, but then we also have this shallow water monitor monitoring data. And and I remember back when we were doing that project, it was it was a real challenge to bring those data sets together in a meaningful way. So I think the management of that data and and that goes back to the point that Margie just made about whether or not we should be moving these measurements around to different places and having short. Uh, short periods of measurements here and then short over there versus staying in one place for a very long period of time. Uh, those are, that's a really good question. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and there's quite a bit in the chat um, that's been going on about citizen science efforts and what could be used from the Chesapeake Monitoring Cooperative um, that brings some of this local shallow water monitoring data into a format that can be utilized. So it sounds like there's a number of steps. I mean, uh, one is uh, data management and and model development to utilize the data that does exist to come into agreement. And then there's certainly, I, I get more of a temporal focus, Margie, than a spatial focus um, for you necessarily. Um, so those are great points about uh, monitoring data. Uh, Kathy had a, um, 
second question that I, I think speaks more to actually model application. Could, should we be strategic with where we apply these resource intensive models and comparing results to better understand shallow water hydro biogeochemical interactions across different sub estuarine systems? So almost if, if there's some, if you would pick out some of um, sub estuarine systems to, to focus on, right? That might represent a gradient or, or special conditions uh, do you have a sense of of where you might go to do that instead of everywhere, trying to get everywhere? Yeah, it's a very a very good question. Um, and we, you know, when we chose the Chester River, we we spent our first probably nine months trying to pick that one out. <laughs> it is a you know, there's so many different places. I guess what I would say. Um, overall is that we just need to move forward with these types of analyses in as in, in an individual tributary and what I would do from the research side of course this is the from the research side of it is go where if there is a certain research group really interested in in the tributary in the their backyard then just go for it nothing less like enthusiasm and drive to you know rather than specifying oh you have to go there um, go where the interest lies. I think that we're going to find interesting research questions and interesting management questions in, in a lot of different regions. I guess you could go where um, a lot of the, the, the uh, money, you know, look at if looking at the different regions where where money is being spent most on on um, uh, uh, nutrient reductions. Um, another possibility is looking in particular detail where our um, water quality standards and where these outcomes are, are not being met, where, where our biggest problems are. Maybe those are, are some of the, um, the, the drivers that, that should lead us to, to, to choosing different locations. Um, but I think that we there are a lot of different locations where we would learn a lot. So it's mm -hmm. hard to pick. Yeah, and I would, just, I would just add to that that I think it would be extremely valuable to carry out some comparative studies where we picked uh, two different sub estuaries. You know, we, uh, the Chester is an Eastern shore uh, tributary. It had, you know, it's kind of a low flow uh, situation. Um, it would be very interesting to do a comparative study with maybe one of, the, one of the Western shore tributaries that have different characteristics, different flow characteristics. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I wish we had had the resources to do that because we would learn so much from doing that. Mm -hmm. There's um, there's some follow up comments on, on that theme that um, that recently came in. So uh, first of all, there's a note from uh, Patrick Neal that uh, Raleigh, you and he are are uh, and others are working on um, FVCOM ICM based models of the Road West River Estuary um, because of a long historical monitoring data set that can be utilized. Um, and then Eric Schott says, urban estuaries are expanding everywhere. Do they need a special category? In terms of, I think, modeling and, and you know, would there be utility to doing a, a sort of in-depth investigation or modeling effort? Is there something different about how those might be functioning or what processes might be happening? Hmm. Um, followed up with input step shoreline. You know, there's a lot of unique things about them. Well, yeah, they are unique. And, and obviously there's gonna be issues with contaminants in urban estuaries. There's gonna be issues. I, I would anticipate that those, those systems are gonna be flashier um, because of the impervious surface. Um, and uh, it, that would, that's, there's some very special circumstances that I don't think we're very well situated uh, uh, to model at this time. Mm -hmm. Although there are some of our colleagues do work explicitly on urban, urban modeling and urban hydrodynamic modeling. Um, and let me just follow up with a question actually that was asked early because it, it points to a, a knowledge gap. Um, and this is one of the ones that was submitted in advance. Is there any particular knowledge gap in understanding the water quality processes between shallow water and deep water? 
So do we understand you know, those biogeochemical processes very well at that interface? And I think Mar or Margie or Raleigh, one of you was actually talking about you know, a, a um, combined model, so to speak, not that there was this boundary between one and the other, right? But, but it was more of a, a, a nested kind of thing. Is there any knowledge, particular knowledge gap about water quality processes? Well, I would say that one thing that we don't understand as well as we'd like to is the estuarine turbidity maximum. Uh, the ETM feature arises in most of the, of the, of the tributaries of, of, of the Chesapeake Bay at some level. And it's an important transition zone in the estuary from the freshwater uh, if, if those of you don't know what the ETM is, it's an area where fresh water meets the salt water and the circulation has this trapping, it has a trapping recirculation effect, which causes sediments to accumulate in a pronounced way right at this interface between the fresh water. And it's a very important area. It's an important nursery ground for fish like striped bass and white perch. Um, and uh, we did undertake a, a study a decade, a decade ago uh, uh, of the main stem uh, Susquehanna uh, ETM, but uh, you know this is a very important transition zone in all of the tributaries. Which I'm not sure we even know if we're modeling it all at it all properly. Hmm. Wow, that's a that's a, a great kind of point to to end um, our thoughts on. I'll we have three minutes to go, so I just want to give an opportunity if um, Raleigh and Margie, based on you know, the questions that people have asked and, and their sort of interpretations of your presentation, uh, just a chance for you to give any sort of ending comments or ask anything of, of the community. Well, I would say, I would say that, you know, these, I think we've spelled out some pretty clear priorities in terms of we, where we need to go uh, with modeling of shallow water areas, including living resources and higher trophic levels. I would encourage any of you that have interests in those research areas to write proposals uh, to, to fund this kind of, uh, it's, it's really basic research um, and, and, and to help us uh, move these, these things forward that we, we really need better models in the tributaries all the way from the hydrodynamics up to fish. Um, and, and, we, and the only way to really to move that forward is, is, for, is for this community to be writing those proposals and getting funded to, to do the work. Yeah, yeah, I'll just, just um, follow up that we know there are, there are, there's a lot of things we don't know. There's a lot of knowledge gaps about basic understanding of, of like biogeochemical processes in the Bay. Um, but there's also a lot of things that we know that are happening in the Bay, processes that we know exist that we don't yet know how to include in our models. And so that's a, it's kind of a two part thing. Um, and so right now, it seems to me the biggest the biggest hole there is getting the, 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 the processes that we already know are happening and are important in the Bay, putting them in these large scale models. So um, for instance, that, that wetting drying place at that high tide, low tide, right at that interaction between the inter interface between the, the, the water and the land, there's a lot going on there and how to get that into the model, into our models so that we can use that information to look at future climate change and future nutrient projections is, is, uh, is a critical. So, just mm. Well, Margie and Raleigh, I'd like to really, really thank you. That was one of the most informative um, hours I've ever spent. I've uh, really learned a lot, and I think you did a great job of laying out some priorities. I'd like to uh, just ask everybody to give them a, a silent round of applause. Uh, the next CRC Roundtable webinar is going to be a special one. It's scheduled for noon to 1.30 on April 21st, and we're going with a Earth Day theme where we're going to look back at what's happened at the Bay Restoration effort, um, consider where we are right now and, and look forward with a pretty um, big panel of people. Our audience for this webinar includes regional academics, graduate students, CBP coordinators and staffers, managers, NGOers and the like. So um, spread the word about the webinar and let us know what future topics you would like to see explored. And just to remind you that this is recorded and we make it available um, on YouTube. So um, thanks everyone for attending 
and um, looking forward to Earth Day. <laughs>